I've started recording, so I'm just going to quickly introduce myself as Tim Fedak. I'm the curator of geology here at the Nova Scotia Museum. And um, we are going to be hearing from Chris Wigda talking about uh, North American mastodons, their evolution, uh, ecology, and extinction. Just want to recognize that uh, here in Halifax, we're, we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq uh, people, um, something for us to continue to to remember and recognize uh, that we're all treaty people here in Nova Scotia. So uh, I've already given a, a brief overview for some folks that are sitting in our uh, lunch and learn here, but want to uh, quickly pass it over to Chris to just give us a, a high level overview of uh, Mastodon evolution. Really grateful for Chris to join us. Um, he's got a lot of uh, expert experience with uh, working with mastodons and Pleistocene animals down at the Gray Fossil Site um, Museum in East Tennessee. So um, it may seem like a bit of a stretch to have someone from Tennessee giving us talk, but uh, perhaps mastodons uh, had that range that um, we, you know, they, they had that same sort of uh, presence here in Nova Scotia and, and Tennessee or down, down the Southern coast. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Chris uh, Wigda. Well, thanks. Thanks, Tim. And, and thanks for having me. Sorry for being a little slow to tune in today. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, uh, this is going to be one of the fastest 16 million year evolutionary histories that I've ever done. Um, so uh, th basically, today, we're going to kind of go on a romp through what are North American mastodons, everything from their their earliest entry into North America, uh, talk a little bit about their ecology, and even get into their extinction. These are all kind of, these are kind of the main questions when we really start talking about mastodons, um, and this is this is where a lot of the research kind of lands. Um, I've, I've uh, been working, I've been down here at the Gray Fossil Site for about five years. Before that, I was at the Illinois State Museum for about 10. And, uh, and so what you're getting from me is really a perspective on um, quaternary mastodons in the Eastern US. Uh, I didn't really work on some of the early one, earlier ones, like at the Gray Fossil Site, we have a, a Pliocene mastodon that I'll talk a little bit about. But I didn't really work on the early side of mastodon evolution until about five years ago, um, and then really got into it. So you know, this is this is uh, in a, mammoths usually get all the press. Um, they are the ones that uh, everybody knows about. They're the ones that you know the the children's movies are made about. Um, but mastodons are equally interesting, and in the last couple of years, they've really seen a resurgence in some of the the uh, the research that's going on. Um, so first off, I'll just call out this art that you're seeing on the on the the first title slide here. This is a reconstruction of our Pliocene age mastodon. So this is a five million year old mastodon from northeast Tennessee, um, and uh, it's from the Great Fossil Site, which is at the foothills of the Appalachians. Um, and uh, it, it's a little different in some ways, and we'll talk more about that as we get into it. Um, there's been some really neat recent work on kind of thinking about proboscidy and diversity. Uh, there, there's a number of groups, a number of, of, uh, of, of proboscidean families that come out of Africa at different times. These are kind of the main ones that you see. It starts with this Moore Ethereum about 25 million years ago. Uh, that, uh, that, well, actually, uh, that, that's a little bit earlier, 50 million years ago or so. Uh, and then we get into some of these big uh, proboscidean relatives that come out of Africa at different times. Mammut or mastodons are really only about the third that makes it out of Africa. Um, we tell them apart primarily in the fossil record on the basis of their teeth. So, you know, Morotherium and Dinotherium both have very, very simple molars. Uh, Gomphotheres and mastodons, kind of this bunodont ridged molar all the way over here to mammoths and, and paleoloxodon, elephantids, that uh, have a very different kind of molar. So this is mostly how we tell them apart. Uh, if we look at the, the timeline of their dispersal out of Africa and into Eurasia, this is what you see. Morotherium never makes it out of Africa. Uh, Dinotheres are out first. Gomphotheres and mammut. Uh, Gomphotheres and mastodons, these are two major groups of, of elephants, uh, make it out of Africa about 20, 30, 25 million years ago. 
Um, mammoths and, and other elephants. So Paleoloxodon is the European straight tusked elephant, and it's also related to mammoths. They don't make it out of Africa until about 5 million years ago. As for North America, only a few of these groups actually make it to North America. Uh, Gomphotheres, mastodons, shovel tuskers or amabelodons, and mammoths. So we do have four different groups Four, four, <laughs> I have a PhD. Uh, four different groups of, of uh, elephants that make it to Eurasia or make it to uh, North America at different times. If we look at North America and when we get our first um, mammutids here or our first elephants here, gomphotheres and mastodons are first on the ground. And we see them, so this is a timeline uh, you know, we've got time up here at the top, about 18 million years ago, about 17 and a half million years ago, we have our first evidence of uh, Gomphothe or Mastodon on the ground in North America. So they, they have a fairly long history of uh, occupation here, uh, Mastodons do, and, it, and it's kind of uh, part and parcel with Gomphotheres. Uh, so we have these two very early elephant groups that come here about 17 million years ago. Oddly enough, the earliest uh, records of both of these groups are not very diagnostic. So we can't say whether Gomphothe or Mastodon, Mastodon got here first, in part because they're very fragmentary records and we can't actually tell apart uh, Gomphothe or Mastodon on the basis of the fossils that are here. Um, in fact, some of these earliest records are actually trackways. So if you make it out to the ALF Museum in California, uh, they have some of the earliest proboscidean trackways in North America, and they date to about 16 million years old. Uh, the funny thing about proboscidean trackways is that they mostly look like giant circles. You can tell they're proboscideans, but you just can't tell which ones. So these are some of the limitations of the fossil record that we have. Uh, if you look in the Eastern US, so this is basically everything up to the Ice Age. Uh, and so if you look at the Eastern US, there's not a lot over here. There's a pretty rich record of proboscideans from Florida. Uh, otherwise, we have the gray fossil site. And that's about it for pre-Ice Age sites in Eastern North America that have elephants. Um, there's a bit more over here on the Atlantic seaboard, but nothing with, a, with, with much of uh, that, that has been very well described or anything like that. Um, the first mastodons in North America are something we call zygolophodon. Uh, and so these are some of those animals that are coming over about 17 million years ago. This is a, 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 a skull that is on display at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in Oregon. Uh, it's been reconstructed on the top, but you can see it's very kind of, kind of very odd shape to its jaw. It's got this very long jaw. It's got these tusks on its chin. Uh, so it's got mandibular tusks. This is really different from uh, you know, our, what we know of elephants, it's very different from what we know of mammoths, you know, mammoths and elephants, Elef the elephant today did not have tusks in their chin, but mastodons and gomphotheres both did. The upper tusks here are a little different too. So they're actually pointed down. They're short, they're pointed down. If we looked at their structure, they'd be very different as well. They have an enamel band. Uh, mastodons, later mastodons, ice age mastodons and mammoths, do not have an enamel band, it's just completely dentin. These are modified front teeth, modified incisors. So they're, they're a very interesting uh, early mastodon here. Uh, and this is another reconstruction of what this animal might have looked like also by Matthew and Abinant. If we look at some of this stuff that's in the Eastern US, this is what we get. So this is one of those Florida uh, mastodons. And this one is about 5 million years old. It, this is a jawbone, so it's got its teeth in its, in its jaw. Uh, it has sockets for these large chin tusks. But overall, this is kind of a shortened tusk. So, you know, this, this jaw is very long and it kind of extends out longer than you think it should. Uh, this one is, is shortened. And that's one of the things that we notice through time in, in, uh, in the North American record is that we see a symphysis is basically this front part of the jaw. And, uh, and we have it, sometimes it's long with tusks, sometimes it's short with tusks, sometimes it's short and doesn't have tusks at all. And so this is a trend towards shortened mandibles. 
uh, and reduction or removal of the, those, those chin tusks towards uh, during, into the Ice Age. Ice Age mastodons also occasionally have chin tusks, but they aren't these big ones. Um, and a lot of times they're just simply absent. This is one of those questions that we're still really trying to wrap our heads around. It's a, it's a variable morphology. We're not quite sure what it means in terms of the evolution of mastodons. Uh, but it does seem to have some sort of, of, uh, of, of time signature. Um, this is the one that has been keeping me awake at night for the last couple of years. This is a, a big jaw from our mastodon, one of our mastodons at the Great Fossil Site here in Northeast Tennessee. It's about 5 million years old. You notice it has this really long jaw. So rather than the jaw stopping right in front of the teeth, it kind of continues out and it has these very large chin tusks on the end. Um, so this is something that the teeth themselves look exactly like uh, our Ice Age mastodons. In fact, the first time I saw this before this, this, this jaw was put together, I'm like, well, those teeth look like they could have come out of a farm in Indiana or Ohio or someplace like that, uh, rather than being from a 5 million year old fossil site in Northeast Tennessee. So there's some really interesting morphologies here with the great fossil site that uh, we're sorting, we're, we're kind of sorting out right now. This is probably going to be a new species ultimately, um, but it's taken us about five years to, to get it out of the ground and get it put together when you do mastodons it really takes uh, it takes a village to 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 get them get them to the point where they can be meaningful scientifically um this brings us to kind of the uh the point where we start talking about ice age mastodons this is definitely where we have the most data uh we have a lot of mastodons that date to the ice age date to the pleistocene throughout North America. They uh, extend from the Yukon and Alaska all the way down to about Honduras. Uh, we have them in the east. We have them in the west. Uh, in fact, as of 2018, we have a new species. Uh, before 2018, we just looked at all North American mastodons. We kind of lumped them all into one group and called them American mastodons or Mammut Americanum. Uh, and so that was this species over here. This is a reconstruction that we did a couple of years ago with Velazar Simeonovsky, uh, who's affiliated with the Field Museum. And so this is a, a reconstruction of a, a site in the Southern Great Lakes region in Northern Illinois. Um, the Pacific Mastodon, on the other hand, we've, we knew that there were Mastodons in California and Oregon along the West Coast. Uh, a few years ago, um, a, a researcher by the name of Alton Dooley uh, and his, became the director at the Western Science Center in Hemet, California, which houses one of the best collections of Western Mastodons in, in the country. And so he started looking at these animals and, and, and figured out there are, there are actually morphological differences between Eastern Mastodons and Western Mastodons. And those differences translate he thinks, and, and they, it's kind of borne out by some of the genetic data, translate into separate species on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Uh, they're definitely different ecologies. So you can kind of look at this one and we're in uh, a spruce and deciduous uh, forest in the Southern Great Lakes. This is a non-analog flora. Um, at this particular locality, we had things like giant beavers. It was very wet, it was very cold. Uh, this is uh, some art by Brian Eng. Uh, who uh, was reconstructing some of these Western mastodons. And he's got a manzanita in the foreground. This is California. This is a Mediterranean climate. Um, and, and even during the Ice Age, it was definitely different from places like the Eastern US and the Great Lakes. Um, morphologically, they kind of sort out a little differently. We tell who, who, who's who in uh, mastodons on the basis of their teeth. So this is just looking at the grinding surface of their teeth. Um, and these are just kind of a length, length versus width plot. And if we look at how these things plot out, Mammut Americanum tends to have larger, wider teeth than Mammut Pacificus. So the, the Western mastodons tend to have longer, more narrow teeth. And this kind of maps out on uh, some of the genetic data as well. So, you know, this is a group of American mastodons. Uh, they're mostly from the Midwest. We've got a couple of specimens down here from Virginia uh, at a site that we've been working on for the last couple of years that are part of this data set. Uh, so this kind of spans the Eastern US and all these teeth would fall into this, this range. Um, the Mammut Pacificus on the other hand, we actually don't have any 
Pacific mastodons where we have both morphology and DNA right now. We're working on that. There's a specimen from uh, uh, from Idaho. There's another one from Oregon. There's uh, one or two from, from Mexico that are in the mix uh, in the DNA lab right now. We're trying to see whether Pacific mastodons map onto you know, this part of the tree, whether they map onto this other part of the tree, where they fit in this mastodon family tree. Um, but right now, you know, it could be that they are, these two specimens are actually, one is from Alberta and one is from Mexico, and not too far from where these Southern California Pacific mastodons are found. Uh, and so I'm kind of thinking that this is a very viable uh, possibility. And so it suggests that these Pacific mastodons, or at least a mastodon group, separated from the rest of North American mastodons about 3 million years ago. So these are, this is, it was a single population before then, uh, and then about 3 million years ago is when things started, uh, they started going their own separate ways. Uh, so it's a pretty deep split. Uh, it's good to point out that we also have a Nova Scotia specimen in here, and it doesn't plot with the rest of our Midwestern material. Um, and so this is one of the things, there's a project going on net right now, Emil Karpitsky at McMaster University is trying to sort some of this out and, and Tim and, and others up there are involved in this work as well. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we've started talking about mastodons, or at least I've started thinking about mastodons in Nova Scotia. This is a really neat uh, place to be thinking about mastodons. Um, you know, we've learned a few things about mastodon paleoecology through the last couple of years. Uh, Emil's work on the DNA was really focused on some of the northern populations up in the Yukon and Alaska. Uh, and it, what he found is that the uh, mastodons that we have up in the Yukon and Alaska, basically during warm periods, uh, during interglacials, these animals would expand their range up into these, these northern areas. And then during the glacial, they would basically, uh, their, their range would contract and the remaining animals up here would be would would go extinct or they'd be extirpated. So they're they're kind of chopped off branches of the mastodon family tree. This corresponds with a project that we had uh, a couple of years ago, where it was kind of it was the museum mastodon version of a pub crawl, where we were basically going from museum to museum to museum, inventorying mammoth and mastodon collections, trying to collect a whole bunch of radiocarbon dates and do some stable isotope dating. Um, in the end, we had a, a pretty good sample of uh, Midwestern mastodons that went all the way up our, our northeasternmost. Uh, sites were basically in Ontario and uh, all the way out to Nebraska and Missouri and Arkansas. And uh, what we found is that during, during the last glacial maximum, when it was maximum cool in the Midwest, all we had in, uh, in the Midwest at that time were mammoths, which are these blue dots. So mammoths are blue dots. Uh, and then as it warmed up, Mastodons came, uh, you know, infiltrated from the south, and by the time we end up at the Alarod Interstadial, right before mammoths and mastodons both go extinct, these red dots are mastodon localities, and we still have a few mammoth localities around, so they're shoulder to shoulder in most of the Midwest, but we have a lot more mastodons. What that means is that mastodons really like warmer climates better than colder climates. They aren't these, you know, heavy duty uh, glacial period sorts of animals, which makes sense when we look at kind of the age of your Nova Scotia mastodons or the age of some of these Yukon and Alaska specimens. This is sorting out into using some new techniques to look at the ecological niche of, of, uh, of our mastodons. So this is some work by one of my students, Matt Bushel, uh, who's kind of sorting this out this semester. Basically what you're looking at here is a niche uh, model of what mastodons should like and where it will plot at different time periods. So this is a niche model, you know, basically the heat map, uh, hot, warm colors are where mastodons would be very happy. Uh, cool colors are where they would be very not so happy. Uh, and then black is where they just probably shouldn't be at all. You can see it's a fairly strained uh, niche distribution. We're not quite sure what this means yet. It's really evolving research. But one of the things that is very obvious is that as we go from the Alarod, which is this niche model here, 13,000 BP, to the Younger Dryas, which is the next climate episode, and we see some cooling um, in the eastern US, 
uh, the red here is the amount of range that is lost uh, at that time between between this time and this period. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a huge loss in uh, a climate niche that these mastodons will be very happy in. Um, and so, and this is also the time where they go extinct. And so this might be something, this might have something to do with, you know, they're a little bit more constrained in their, their ecological niche than we initially thought. Um, so kind of to, to recap just quickly, because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, historically, we have seen mastodons as kind of this monolithic species. Um, and it's really been driven by the record in the Eastern US, been driven by the record in the Midwest, particularly, where we think that they, they occupy a spruce parkland. We think that they're browsing herbivores, so they would have never really been in a place where there are um, uh, any open prairies or anything like that. They're really forest dwellers. Um, you know, we see it historically, we saw this tooth as very similar across their range. So it's, that's why in the Western US and in the Eastern US, there really wasn't, it wasn't, they weren't seen as separate species or even a hypervariable species until very recently. And that, that kind of translated into this idea of kind of a rigid or constrained ecological niche. I will say for sure that this, this paradigm is really evolving currently. So yeah, they are in Spruce Parkland in the Midwest, but if we zoom out and we look at them at a continental level, you know, this could include mixed coniferous de deciduous forests, these non-analog things in the de Midwest, deciduous forests down here in the Southeast, semi-open forests in the West. Um, they still seem to be browsers. Uh, they still seem to occupy uh, forest to some degree, um, but they also have variable morphology and kind of a flexible ecological niche. Um, we can add to that, they have this deeply divided population. You know, there's a complex history of adaptation to North American ecosystems that, you know, there's these deep splits in that mastodon family tree and those correspond to different geographic populations. Um, they're relatively thermophilic, so they like warm climates better than they like cold climates. And then looking at kind of how they're going extinct, we think they may be going extinct, uh, you know, with this shrinking range at the end of the, the Pleistocene, uh, which brings us to kind of the bitter end of what their extinction kind of looks like. And I think I have a few more minutes, hopefully, um, but just a few more slides. Uh, this is some of the results from our big mammoth and mastodon project a few years ago. So the one that I kind of showed you some maps of already. Um, we started the project with about 250 mammoth and mastodon localities uh, throughout the Midwest. So we knew that the Midwest had a whole bunch of mammoths and mastodons in it. And then we did a whole bunch more research going to small town museums, big museums. If, if they had a mastodon there, we were there. Um, and so we increased our sample size to over 600 mammoth and mastodon localities, of which mammoths and mastodons were split. Uh, we had about half and half, depending on where they were. Um, but if we really look at the time period of their extinction and we look at the radiocarbon dates that we have, um, so that's what you're looking at here on the bottom axis, we have uh, you know, basically time. So older at the left side and younger at the right side. And then we have these, uh, these, are, these are basically kind of weighted probability curves of all of our radiocarbon dates combined, comparing mastodons in red and mammoths in blue. And what we find is that as we get to the end of this, this climate period called the bowling owl rod, mammoths are kind of there periodically through the whole thing. They're never really there in huge numbers. Mastodons, though, really come in and they actually hit their peak uh, right before their extinction. Within a few hundred years of when they go extinct, we see some of the largest numbers of mastodon sites on the landscape. And this is really interesting. Uh, this, this was not something that we expected. Um, ultimately, you know, the, a lot of times the, the, the why these animals went extinct, we have a number of different scenarios that explain this. In their most simple cases, um, most people land on either it is some sort of climate-related 
uh, extinction event where climate is really driving ecological change in different places at different times, uh, or it is human overkill. So people came in. This time period also corresponds where we see uh, some of the, the 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 first time we have kind of widespread human populations in the north in 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 the U.S. as well. And so teasing apart those two different scenarios becomes kind of difficult. And one, so mapping this onto kind of ecological changes in the Midwest. Um, so we could see if I, no, oh, I, I left off my, uh, my, my curve here. So the bowling owl rod kind of maps onto this period here. This is, we're going from a spruce parkland to uh, kind of an open uh, or a uh, wet deciduous spruce forest back to spruce parkland to our Holocene ecosystems here. And this is the time period where mastodons seem to go extinct. So there's there's kind of climate swinging back and forth, and there's definitely a an impact on the vegetation communities in that landscape. So uh, so that's kind of this is when they go extinct, right when we see a shift from the this kind of wet deciduous spruce forest back to something that's more of a spruce parkland, uh, and and actually mastodons go extinct in the lag time in between the the climate change that is evident in the ice cores um you know in the greenland ice sheet and the response time of midwestern vegetation to that climate change so there the 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 correlation between these two is pretty good um on the other hand archaeologically speaking it's really difficult to kind of operationalize some of these things you know what criteria must sites meet to be considered archaeological this is something that is an ongoing debate within the archaeological community you have to have dates you have to have a documented human presence and then you have to have really tight data associating those two things um and the record in the midwest well, actually, uh, continent-wide is kind of interesting. Uh, Gra uh, Don Grayson and David Meltzer a couple of years ago basically went through all the archaeological sites that were proposed as uh, megafaunal kill sites and said, okay, out of, you know, starting with over 100, most of these are things that we can't really operationalize. They're, they're missing dates. They're missing an association. They're missing good evidence of human behavior. Um, so they ended up with a, a total of about 15 sites, almost all of which were mammoths or mastodons. Uh, of those, uh, what you've got here in red circles are their sites that uh, that that are that include mastodons, not mammoths. Um, and then they removed a number of these as problematic because it didn't have uh, quite that trifecta of data that supported human hunting of mastodons. So we're left with two here, uh, one of which is the Pleasant Lake site, uh, and one of which is the uh, Kimswick, Kimswick site in St. Louis. Um, and we, this, is, this is part of our study area. So we did, we looked at the Kimswick site in, in, at St. Louis, and this is uh, one that was one that I curated at the Illinois State Museum. Um, but even if we kind of take these two at face value, and say, okay, let's go with the assumption that people are hunting mastodons. Uh, you know, if we take our data set from 2017, we had over 600 localities of mammoths and mastodons. We had over 250 mastodon localities. Less than 1% of those show carnivore modification. So gnawing on the bones or anything like that. Less than 1% 1 1 show human association. So not even evidence of hunting, just the fact that there might be some tools in association with uh, with mastodon bones. There's actually behaviorally, there's no evidence that people are actually hunting these animals in the Midwest. Um, so no empirical evidence. Um, that gives brings us back to uh, kind of some hot takes on this argument. So from, from our perspective in the Eastern US and in, in the Midwest, there's a pretty good argument for climate-driven landscape changes strongly affecting mastodon populations. The argument for mastodon hunting is not really very well supported, uh, you know, based on the empirical evidence. There's some model-driven assumptions about Clovis and about uh, how hunter-gatherers would have utilized the landscape that uh, often provides more hypotheses for testing. But if we go back to the fossil record itself, a lot of times it's just not supported. Um, if we zoom out, there is some uh, evidence that the there's some really interesting 
uh, kind of work on how paleontologists and archaeologists approach this idea and approach the, this extinction. Uh, most of the time, paleontologists and archaeologists, the ones who are actually digging up these sites, have a much more nuanced view of how these megafaunal extinctions take place. And this plays out in the citation record. It pl plays out in, in, in uh, community surveys and that sort of thing. Oftentimes when ecologists get involved and they're one step removed from uh, you know, that, that dirt record of excavation, uh, they tend to accept human overkill scenarios a little bit more uncritically. Um, so this is something that's really interesting and still kind of playing out in the literature. Um, I think kind of uh, just to wrap things up, uh, you know, kind of looking at some of the, the main directions of uh, where this is going in the future, the mastodon phylogenetics is still playing out. Emil's got new samples in the lab, uh, and, uh, and certainly that's some of what we're talking about with Nova Scotia mastodons, uh, but also the morphology is still playing out. So, you know, are there other characters other than just teeth uh, that tease apart these, these different populations of mastodons? Um, there's a growing awareness that elephants impact landscapes. Um, whether they're pushing over trees and, and adding holes into, in, into forest canopy uh, or whether it's a nutrient cycling. And so kind of in, integrating that sort of understanding into um, you know, our, our understanding of, of, of uh, past ecosystems in the Eastern US is, is definitely one of those things that's uh, on, on, our, on, our, on our plate to think about. Uh, and then mastodon on human interactions, those are definitely two things that are, are kind of, we're hammering out as well. Uh, even looking at those two sites in the Eastern US that have been around for a while, um, the Kimswick site is a complex site. There are potentially hundreds of mastodons there, but not all of them are associated with people. And so there's some complex taphonomy there that is going on that, uh, has never been really explored. Uh, Russ Graham is working on that now. He's the one who originally excavated the site. And, uh, and now we've got some new archeological interest in it as well. So um, I'll, that was a whirlwind tour, but I'll end there. And, uh, and we can- That was super. Up for questions if we have any time. <laughs> that was really super. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really great to see all those different uh, uh, new insights that are coming from the different research. And thanks for sharing all those with us. Um, yeah, we're probably going to start uh, having some people uh, log off as this Lunch and Learn is coming to a, an end time-wise, but 